Well, this morning, Pastor Jeff is continuing a new series, uh, Pilgrim Songs, talking about the Psalms of Ascent. And today we're going to be looking at the mercy of God. We're going to be talking about how there's things that happen in our lives, things that we do that we can hold on to, but we can have confidence knowing that no matter what greatness of amount of sin that we have, his mercy is greater. His mercy is more than that. So we're going to sing that together. Praise the Lord, his mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new every morn, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. Yes, you, you, can, you can certainly clap for that mercy. How many of you are, are, are blessed by God's mercy each and every day? Just give a big shout. You don't have to lift your hand. Give a big shout for that of praise. We're, we're glad that you're here this morning uh, to lift that truth up and praise and worship today. Look forward to spending uh, just a few minutes uh, spending time in God's word looking at that. 
as we continue our series in Psalms. We want to welcome you here today uh, on behalf of our staff. We want to thank you for choosing to be here this morning, especially those of you who are our guests. Uh, there's a card in the pew rack in front of you. We'd like to ask that at some point in the service, if you would fill that out, uh, place that in the offering plate when it comes by here in just a minute, or you can drop it in one of the boxes when you leave the service today. Also know in the pew rack in front of you, there's cards that if you've got a prayer request, we'd love to lift that up. You can again fill that out, place it in the offering plate when it comes by. And then the 11 o'clock service during this hour, there'll be a time in our service when our kids, kindergarten through second grade are dismissed. And so if you're visiting today, and you've got one of those kiddos with you, you can fill the card out that says kids with your information. Send that with them. They'll go out these doors, go with our adult leadership for our kids' ministry over to Building 8 and spend some time there and kids' worship later during the service. So we're excited uh, that each one of you are here today. We're going to continue singing in just a minute, but I'm going to ask you uh, to say hello to those around you before we continue worship today. seats. Our ushers are going to be making their way forward. It's at this point in our service where we have the opportunity, you can be seated by the way, but we have the opportunity to uh, give back a portion of what uh, God has blessed us with. And so I'm going to pray for that um, as our ushers are, are preparing to, to take this offering at this time. God, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to worship you this morning. I pray that more than just our song, the way that we live, um, and through our giving, you are honored and you are glorified. So I pray that um, as we come to this time of offering, that you would accept this as a, um, an offering that recognizes that you've blessed us, and so we want to give some of that back to you. I pray that you would continue to uh, be present in this room and be uh, glorified in our worship today. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Could fathom 
Perhaps I cry to you In darkest places I will call Incline your ear to me anew And hear my cry for mercy Were you to count my sinful ways How could I come before your throne Yet full forgiveness meets my gaze pray that we would be people who experience your mercy. And even in the darkest times, we can trust you. That we will be patient and wait on you, seeking after you even when it hurts. And I pray that we would see the forgiveness that you're holding out for us in those dark times. So I pray this morning that you would speak to us, reveal those areas in our lives you would help us to see where we're looking for hope elsewhere. You would help us to see where we're resting in our guilt instead of resting in our forgiveness. I pray that you would speak through Pastor Jeff this morning. And that your word would be evident. That we would get to see what it means to hand that over to you and to trust him and to wait on you. So speak to us now.
Well, good morning. It's all, well, I like that, man. That's good. Yeah, it's good to see you all this morning. Uh, it's always good to see you. I've got, I've got some special guests here this morning. My, my friend Mike uh, is here. Mike and his wife, Carol, uh, they live in Indiana, but Mike and I met at U of H. Uh, he came down to, to uh, renew, you know, get together with some old friends from the U of H band uh, and to see our team get stomped, of course. But uh, it's good to have them here. We've known each other since, heck, Ronald Reagan was president when we met, so uh, it's been a while. And then I just bumped into a young lady here named Lindsay who grew up not just in my hometown, but we grew up out in the country, out in a little community called Hope that had uh, two stores, uh, two, two uh, churches, and that's about it. It used to be a school, not even that anymore, but uh, Lindsay's here this morning, so it was really great to see her. I grew up with her, her dad, so uh, really cool. Now, we've got other special guests here this morning. I don't know how many of you are familiar with an organization called the Gideons, some of you have heard of them. Some of you just think they're the guys that make sure there's a, there's a Bible in your hotel room when you, when you stay in a hotel. Uh, they actually do a lot more than that. The Gideons have been around since 1899. It's a group of men and women, and they're devoted to making sure that the Word of God gets into the hands of as many people as possible. They placed two billion Bibles uh, in different places in, in the course of those 120-something years. Uh, they, put, they, they hand out Bibles at schools, in hospitals, nursing homes, uh, prisons, and to our military and anywhere, basically anywhere that will let them. Uh, they are here to give you some information on the organization out in the atrium. If you're interested, if you are looking for a way to get involved in spreading the Word of God, if you haven't found your ministry, we're always talking here at First Baptist about this is not the finish line. Getting here on Sunday morning may be a heck of an accomplishment for you, but this is not the end. This is supposed to launch you out into ministry in the community to find the place God designed you to, to serve Him. And if you haven't found that yet, you might consider talking to the Gideons and see if you can be part of what they're doing. Or if you need an extra something, you want to be involved in something more, then, then talk to them. They've got, they can answer your questions out there in the atrium. So we are honored to have them this morning. Y'all turn with me to Psalm 130. Psalm 130. And one thing you notice, if you've never read all the Psalms, the entire Psalter, you've never read them before, and you read them for the first time this past year, as, we read through, as we've been reading through the whole Bible, one of the things you notice is the Psalms are incredibly emotionally honest. I mean, they are real and they are raw, and, and it just it bears out something that I've noticed, and I hate to make generalizations like this, but it seems to me that people in the Middle East are a little more comfortable expressing emotion than people in the West like us. One of the things you see this in is when you see video of a funeral in Israel or Saudi Arabia or any place in that part of the world, people are very emotional at the passing of one of their loved ones. And they, they tear their garments and they cry out and they weep openly and they fall on the ground. I mean, they are inconsolable. Whereas here in the West, when we have a funeral, and I've, I go to a lot of funerals, I do a lot of funerals, we're very sedate, we're very dignified, we're very composed. And, and if somebody at a funeral cries out loud, if someone loses their composure, we all think, oh, that's a shame. We're, we're embarrassed for them. Why? I don't, I've never understood why that is. I mean, if you're going to grieve and mourn a loved one, why not do it openly in front of the people who love you most, who are around you at that funeral service? But that's just the way we're, our culture works. I'll give you another example. Whether you like the kind of music we had here this morning, I thought our band did an outstanding job, love the accordion, uh, whether you love that kind of music or whether you love more traditional music with choirs and organs and, and piano and, and the traditional hymns or whether you like black gospel or southern gospel or whatever you like, I'll bet your favorite worship songs are very positive and upbeat, aren't they? I know some people who say, I won't sing a song in a minor key, I just don't sing sad songs. And yet when you read the Psalms, these 150 Psalms, that's the hymn book of Israel. These are the hymns that Jesus grew up singing in worship. And while there are some Psalms of praise, there are also Psalms of lament. Those are the Psalms where the psalmist complains, where the psalmist says, where are you, God? I've been praying and you haven't shown up. And believe it or not, there's actually more Psalms of lament than there are Psalms of praise in the Psalter. Here's an example of one, Psalm 88. This is the darkest of all the Psalms of Lament. It says, O oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. Now, can you imagine if we put that to music and sang it on a Sunday morning? Would that be, anybody, would that be on anybody's Spotify playlist? I doubt it. 
And I'm not saying we need to do that. I'm not saying we need to start singing sad songs or we need to start uh, changing the way we act at funerals. That's not my point. My point is that honesty is good. And when we are standing before the Lord in prayer, we need to be honest with Him. And if you still pray like when you're praying to the Lord, if it still sounds like the deacons used to pray when you were a little kid and it was very King James English and very formal and very correct, you're missing it. You need to just tell God what you're feeling. You need to open up to Him and just say, Lord, I'm struggling. I'm hurting. Lord, I don't know where you are. I don't understand why you haven't given me this thing I've asked for. Lord, I need you. Because you know what? He knows that you think that anyway. So you might as well express it to Him. We see that all through the Psalms. We see that all through the Scriptures. And, And this one is a perfect example. Psalm 130 is by far not the darkest of the Psalms. It's not even a song of lament. It's one of the Psalms of Ascent. And that's what we're studying right now. The songs, those 15 Psalms of Ascent that the pilgrims in Israel used to sing together as they would walk on the way to the temple in Jerusalem three times a year for those festivals. So let's read 130 because even though it's not as dark as some, it, it, it speaks to an emotion that I think most of us would rather not talk about. 130 says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His Word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with Him is plentiful redemption. And He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. So you notice the way it starts off. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. It's interesting, the song we just sang is basically this psalm put to music. So this may have already sounded familiar to you. Out of the depths I cry to you. I like the way Eugene Peterson, in the message, he paraphrases it this way. It says, help God, the bottom has fallen out of my life. It's like the psalmist was walking along and everything was great and all of a sudden a trap door opened and he was plunged into this deep pit full of water and mud and there's nothing but darkness around and there's no sound of anyone coming to help him and he's saying, Lord, I need you. I'm hurting. But then you get to verse 3 and you you realize what he says there. If you, Lord, marked iniquities, if you kept a count of sins, I would be a dead man. So you understand what what he's hurting from. His problem is he's full of shame. He thinks he deserves what he's going through. He is full of shame. He hates himself. Somebody has said that there's a difference between guilt and shame. We think of them as equal, but guilt is feeling regret over something you've done, but shame is not liking who you are. Guilt is hating what you did, but shame is hating who you've become. My daughter, when she was little, had a good friend uh, that she hung out with all the time, and her friend's mom worked for a financial management company, and the guy who ran the company was very, very successful. In fact, he did uh, the finances. He handled the portfolio for a lot of famous sports figures, people I could name that many of you have heard of. And when she found out that we were into sports, she invited us to sit in his luxury box at basketball games. Now, I don't know if you've ever sat in a luxury box. If you haven't, don't do it because it'll ruin sports for you. (laughs) Because we were used to sitting in the cheap seats, right? And you sit around the riffraff and and people who don't understand the game and they're acting ridiculous and they're cussing and they're being, they're just being, it's just, and then you got to get up and go get your popcorn. You got to get up and go get your Dr. Pepper. And you got to stand in line. There, you sit there and they wait on you. And you're among the well healed people. And you've got nice, comfortable seats. And no one stands up in front of you. And I met the guy and he was really nice. And I found out he gives a lot of money to a lot of charitable organizations. And I thought, man, what a great guy, especially because he's giving me free nachos, right? I mean, it's, it's awesome. And then a couple of years later, uh, the, the Final Four came to Houston the first time, and he invited us to his Final Four party, which was fantastic. So, you know, thanks to my daughter's friend, we got this invite to this party. This is the party he did. He, he rented out the House of Blues in downtown Houston, the whole place. And so we're, we're eating hors d'oeuvres and, and eating these fancy little finger foods and mingling with people we've seen on TV. And I took a couple of pictures with like famous athletes and coaches, and this was really fun. 
And it wasn't, it seems like it wasn't that long afterwards that we got a call from, from uh, Kaylee's friend's mom, and she said she was in tears because her boss had been found dead. And then, 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 we, then we found out that he had taken his own life. And then we found out why. Because all along, this whole incredibly successful organization he was running was actually a pyramid scheme. So it was all lies. He was promising these great returns to his clients, but it didn't really exist. And so all these people who had trusted him with their money, they were left with nothing. And the SEC had started investigating, and, and he took his life. And I remember when it happened, I said, well, I guess he did that because he doesn't want to go to jail. But years later, I read an article about him. And, and it told what actually happened was it wasn't that he felt guilty about what he'd done. He felt shame. And, and here's why I say that. What the, what the article said was most people who run these kinds of organizations, these kind of Ponzi schemes, they don't have empathy at all. Like Bernie Madoff, you've probably heard of him. He ran the biggest uh, Ponzi scheme in history. They say he's a complete sociopath. He cares nothing about his victims. He doesn't feel a bit of guilt. But this guy had taken out big life insurance policies, and without asking their permission, he had made some of his clients his beneficiaries instead of his family. And you could see what he was thinking. He knew all along, what I'm doing is terrible. I am a terrible person. I'm lying to these people. But one of these days... I'm going to die, and, I'm going to, and at least they're going to get something out of my death. And in his mind, to take his own life before the government got their hands on the money was better, because at least he gave them a little something. I don't deserve to live. That's what shame says. I don't deserve to live. I have become something terrible, and it's better for me to die. And there's all kinds of ways that manifests itself. Most of them don't make the newspapers. There's the young woman who looks back in, in her life at, at the baby she aborted, and she wishes, even though she's got children now, she thinks, what if I could hit rewind and, and go back and, and make a different decision? At the time, I did what I thought was my only choice, and now I wish I could redo that. Or the, the young man, the, the man who has lost his family and, and his ex-wife, can't stand him. His, his kids won't even talk to him. He, he just he can't even think about what she's saying to them when he's not around. And he knows he was an angry person. He knows he lashed out at them too often. He knows he was selfish. It's not totally his fault, of course. It's never all one person's fault, but just to think about the person he was when he was married, he can't, he can't reconcile that with his own image of himself. And there's the young woman who Grew up the apple of her parents' eye, smart, talented, successful, head cheerleader, president of her class, popular kid. She's going to do great things. And now she's in her mid-30s. Most of her friends have gotten married, have families. They're off to successful careers, and she's still drifting. And she just got an invitation to that 15th high school reunion, and there's no way she's going. She's not going to see. She doesn't want to see her old classmates and, and tell them, oh, well, here's what I'm doing now. Or the man in his middle years, when you ask him, he can't think of anything he's done that he really regrets. He just doesn't like who he is. It's hard to explain, but every day he wakes up and it's just hard to even get up and go to work. He just doesn't like who he's become. Does any of that resonate with you? See, shame is something everyone feels at some point, and some people can't even explain why it's there. For some, it's some black mark, uh, some terrible thing they did that they deeply regret and they can never change. And for others, it's just an inner sense that I don't measure up. And I want you to know, guilt at least has something redemptive about it because if you feel guilty over something you've done, you can repent before God and be made right. If you feel guilty about people you've hurt or people you've wronged, you can go out of your way to try to make it up to them. But shame, there is nothing redemptive in shame. Shame is awful, and God hates it. So what does He do about it? What does Psalm 130 tell us? I cry out to You from the depths, O Lord. I've got so many iniquities. I'm a dead man before You. And yet, three things. Number one, cry out for His mercy. Cry out for His mercy. In verse 4, He says, But with You there is forgiveness, that You may be feared. Now, that's an unusual turn of phrase, isn't it? There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And if you've never read the Bible before and you get to 130 and you read that, you might think, well, why would I be afraid of a God who forgives me of anything I've done? 
That's because the fear he's talking about here is not like the fear you feel when you're in a haunted house at Halloween time, or the fear you feel when you spot a snake in your yard, or the fear you feel when it's dark and you hear a sound outside your window. It's not fear like that. It is, some people say it's reverence, but I think it's even more than that. It's, it's an inner sense that my whole self is bound up in God, that He has become the center of my life, that nothing matters more. In fact, nothing matters even close to as much as me living out His purpose for my life and glorifying His name. Someone has described it this way, and this is my favorite metaphor for the fear of God. Anybody here ever visited the Grand Canyon? How many Grand Canyon people? Okay, so about half. Okay, so here's the thing about the Grand Canyon. People who don't go and they say, well, I'm not going to drive all those hours just to look at a hole in the ground, you don't know. You've got to go. You've got to see it. There's no description that does it adequate justice. You can't just see pictures, even, in, even on your high-def television. It's not enough. When you go to the Grand Canyon, and you're standing there on that overlook, and you're looking across all that vastness, you got several competing emotions all at the same time. One part of you is like, dang, if I took two steps, I'd be dead. And so there's a sense of, you know, that little bottom dropping out of your stomach and, and your heart racing and kind of, uh, kind of a tingling, kind of a trembling. But at the same time, at the same time, there's a sense that, man, I am right where I want to be. Nobody stands at the, at the edge of the Grand Canyon checking their phone. Nobody stands at the edge of the Grand Canyon thinking about the score of the ball game or who posted what on social media. All you're thinking is, this is amazing. You're drawn to it. You're in awe of it. And that's the fear of God. He becomes the center of your universe. Everything you do is bound up in, well, how does this reflect on His glory? Because He is the center of my world. Well, what does that have to do with forgiveness? What does that have to do with mercy? Well, think about the story. Many of you know this story. So Jesus was given a dinner invitation by an unlikely host. He was one of the religious leaders of Israel, a Pharisee. And this guy had brought Jesus into his house not just to enjoy his company, but he wanted to decide for himself whether Jesus was really real, whether he was Messiah or not. And while they were dining together, the door swings open and in walks a woman who everyone in that village knew was a sinner. And when ancient literature refers to a woman as a sinner, it usually means she's a prostitute, an adulteress. In some way, she's gone against the social norms. And this woman is full of shame, or at least she was. She comes in and she gets down at Jesus' feet. She unbinds her hair, which is a sign. I mean, in that culture, women didn't do that. She begins to weep over him. And with her tears and the kisses of her lips, she begins to bathe his feet, wiping them with her hair. She takes this bottle of ointment, breaks the neck of it, and pours it over his feet. And the Pharisee is watching this, and he's thinking, okay, case closed. If this guy was a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is who's touching him, and he'd never let this woman touch him. So I know he's just a man. But Jesus interrupts his thoughts. Don't you wish you had the ability to do that? Don't you wish you could say, I know what you're thinking? Jesus did. And he said, you know what? You know why this woman has done this? Do you know why this woman is degrading herself in this way? Do you know why this woman has just opened up has just broken the most valuable thing she owns in this extravagant offering of love to me. Do you know why I am now the center of her world? Because she's been forgiven. Because she knows I used to be this shameful person, and now I'm a child of the King. Now I'm a daughter of Jehovah. Now there is nobody who has anything on me. He said, she loves me because she's been forgiven. You don't love me at all because you've never been forgiven. Cry out for His mercy. That's the unique thing about Christianity. Every other religion has a code that says, do this, do this, do this. These seven steps, these five steps, these three steps. You do these things, you've got a good shot. Christianity is the only one that says, just call out for help. And He's there. All you got to do is just say, Lord, my sins, they are many, but Your mercy is more. So come and cleanse me. Secondly, wait on him. Wait on him. And this is the hard part. Notice that people will sometimes say, I know God has forgiven me, especially if you've grown up in church. This is stuff, this is a message so far you've heard before. But have you ever heard someone say or, or said yourself, I know God forgives me, I just don't feel forgiven. Or I know God forgives me, I just, I can't forgive myself. 
I think that's what the the psalmist is saying in verses 5 and 6. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning. And then he repeats it, more than watchman for the morning. Do you know that when the Bible talks about waiting, it's talking about hope? Okay, so hope. Let me tell you what hope is in Scripture. It's not what we mean. You know, hope in our, in our world is, man, I hope my team wins. That didn't work out for me this weekend. Uh, I hope my, my child's not getting into trouble. Hope in Scripture is different. See, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be Thanksgiving, and most of you aren't going to be cooking your Thanksgiving dinner. If you're like me, you're going to be sitting in the living room watching football, but you're going to be smelling it. It's going to be cooking, and you're going to smell it, and you're going to think, man, that sounds good. That smells good. That's hope. Because you know it's going to be yours. You just can't eat it yet. Go in there and try to eat some now. Your mom or your grandma smacks your hand with a spatula, right? You have to wait. Jeff, what are you waiting on? You want to go get burgers? Heck no. I'm waiting on Thanksgiving dinner. What is my hope in? My hope is in that turkey and dressing at that moment. The psalmist's hope is in the Lord. He says, more than watchmen wait for the morning. I don't know if any of you have ever worked as a watchman. I haven't. Eugene Peterson has, the guy who translated uh, the, message, uh, the message translation of the Bible, and he says it's the most boring job in the world because you just sit there. You sit at your post, and most nights nothing happens. In fact, those are the good nights. Nothing happens. Nothing. Maybe some old wino comes and talks to you, something like that. Maybe a cop walks by and, and gives you a story or something at best, but you're just waiting. You're waiting for the sunrise because you know that when that sun peeks over the horizon, and bathe the ground in light, you get to clock out and eat some pancakes and go home and get some rest. And so that last hour before the sunrise is your longest hour of the whole day because you're waiting, you're waiting. Come on, son, come on. I'm ready to clock out. And yet you know it's going to happen. There's no, man, I, I sure hope, it's, I hope the sun rises today because you know it's going to happen. That's hope. That's waiting. And that's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, I know you've forgiven me, Lord, but I don't feel forgiven yet. I know you've cleansed me, but I still feel dirty, so I'm waiting on your love to come and cleanse me from head to toe, from from between the ears all the way down. Tim Keller used to be puzzled when he was a young preacher at at people who would say, I've been forgiven, but I can't forgive myself. And, And he'd say, well, don't you understand? God loves you so much, he became a man named Jesus who died on a cross for your sins, and he would do it again if that's what it took. That's how much you mean to God. And they'd say, yeah, that's wonderful, but I still feel ashamed of myself. And finally, he realized, and and some of you aren't going to like this, but I think he's right about this. When you say, I can't forgive myself, I don't feel forgiven, what the truth about this is, is you've put your hope in something besides God. You've put your hope in the wrong thing. Yeah, God's forgiven me, but that's not really what I'm after. I'm after something else, and that something else is letting me down. So that man I mentioned a while ago who lost his family, yeah, God's forgiven him and he's glad. He's glad he gets to go to heaven when he dies, but his hope, his real hope is in, I really wish my, my wife would come home. I really wish my kids would come and, and, and let me be their dad again. And if we could be a family again, then I'd feel whole. And because that's not happening, he feels that shame, he feels that brokenness. Because his hope isn't in God, his hope is in something else. That young woman who who envies the Instagram-worthy lives of her friends, she's hoping in success. She's hoping that somehow in her mid-30s she can restart things and, and get to the top of the mountain like she always thought she would. And she can enjoy those vacations and she can buy that house and she can have those kids and she can have all the things in those pictures she sees on social media. And until that happens, she'll still feel like a loser, like like somebody who's worthless. Because she, her, her, her hope is in something other than in her worth in the eyes of God. And all you have to do is, is confess that and say, Lord, I know you've forgiven me. Lord, I, if my wife and my kids never talk to me again, then I will still love them. I will still be the best dad I can be from a distance. But I'm going to put my focus on you because all the times I've hurt you, you still accept me. You still love me. I'm going to put my focus on you. Lord, I I know that the world would look at me and say I've done nothing with my life. I know I feel like a loser, but that doesn't matter because you have created me for a purpose, and that did not change. And so from now on, from this point forward, I'm going to forget about what others think of me and what I think of myself. I'm just going to pour myself into being the woman you created me to be and, 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 and live out the life you made me to live. 
And that's where the joy is found. Right there in the mercy of God. Wait on Him. And then finally, number three, bring others along. You bring others along with you. This is not a solo affair. Notice the psalm ends with him saying, Oh Israel, hope in the Lord. There is plentiful redemption with him. He will redeem us from all our iniquities. Oh Israel, hope in the Lord. What is that about? See, I I said this a few weeks ago in in our previous series, and y'all thought it was pretty funny, but it's really true. The word y'all is a biblical word. Remember that? Because when, when... the, the word you is used in the Bible. Oftentimes it is a plural you. And in English, we don't have a plural you unless you're from the South and then you say y'all. And so the psalmist is saying, oh, y'all, come on, let's go. There's mercy with God. Let's get to him. Because you need to understand, they thought differently in this world. Nobody in Israel in the ancient world would have said, well, I'm right with God, so that's all that matters. This guy's not content with him getting forgiven. He wants his whole nation to be renewed and redeemed. He knows that as a people, the Israelites had failed God again and again and again. As a nation, they were full of shame. And yet he says, there's mercy with God. His mercy is greater than our sins. There's redemption there. Let's go. Let's be renewed. Let's be revived as a nation and follow him faithfully together. Remember, this is a song that people sang as they were walking the hill, the ascension, all the way up to Jerusalem. Whether it took them a month or a week or a couple of days, they sang this song. This was on their playlist over and over again. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. And they would remind themselves, we're headed to the God who redeems us. The God who loves us. The God who never, ever changes. You know, we had a friend at uh, another church when I was younger. Kaylee was a little bitty girl. And, and this friend was just not quite old enough to be our mom. A little bit older than us. Old enough to, to give us advice and to dote on Kaylee and sort of be a surrogate grandma. And one day, I noticed that she hadn't been in church for a few weeks. And I called her and I said, where have you been? And she told me she'd been going through some real emotional problems and, and she was just struggling. And, and she said, I, I just, I can't come to church because I sit in the choir, I, I sing in the choir and everybody's looking at me and I don't want to sit up there and just cry. And that's what I would do. If I sat in that church, I would just cry the whole time. And y'all, I have to say, you know how there are some people who they can just come up with the right thing to say in a moment? I'm not that guy. You know, I do fine behind this pulpit because i got time to prepare, but I'm not the guy that just comes up with that perfect, eloquent, wise saying. I I just don't. I'm the guy who says, well, shoot, that sounds pretty bad. I'm sorry, you know. Did you watch the game last night? I I don't don't know what to do. But this was one of those weird moments where the Holy Spirit just all of a sudden just decided, I'm going to give him one. And so she said, I would just sit there and cry the whole time. And I said, yeah, but what better place to cry? Because your whole church family's there. I mean, this is a church of about 120 people. Everybody knew everybody. I said, why not let everybody there know you're struggling? They don't even need to know what it's about. They'll look up there in the choir and see you crying, and they'll say, I need to pray for her. Isn't that what you need? And she was there the next Sunday. And I don't know if she cried or not, because this was one of those churches where the choir thought they had to stay behind the pastor the whole time, staring at the back of my head. So I don't know if she cried or not, but she was there. And and I want you to hear this. I mean, I know you're here, but there may be somebody listening uh, online or or watching the stream who said, yeah, I couldn't go to church today. I'm just just not feeling it today. I I just don't know that I'm, I, I need to be there because I'm just not worthy. Maybe you'll be in that position someday. I want you to hear something. One of the, one of the worst things about the human uh, predicament is when we feel ashamed of ourselves, we tend to isolate from other people because we think they think about us the way we think about ourselves. And one of the worst things is uh, church people are no different, and, and you hit a, a section of your life where you feel a sense of shame, and your first, first thought is, well, I can't go to church because those people have it all together. Okay, if anybody's daydreaming right now, I want you to listen to this next part, okay? You with me? Do I need to jump in jacks to get your attention? This is what you came to hear. This is what God brought you here to hear. Are you ready for this? I've been here nearly four years, so I can say this with absolute certainty. You look around this room, nobody, nobody, absolutely nobody in this room has it all together. 
Nobody has got life all figured out. This room, this, this building, this community is a hospital. It's not a museum. It's not a hall of fame. It is a hospital for broken people. And, and if, if you gave everybody in this room truth serum and, and they just got up one after one and, and, gave, and testified in front of this microphone, you sitting there feeling unworthy, you would suddenly go, oh my goodness, he struggles with the same thing I do. She stumbled in the same way I did. Or, well, that's not the same as my struggle, but I can see why it would be just as hard. There are people in this room, I don't know who all they are because I don't know everything. I'm not the Holy Spirit, but I guarantee there are people in this room that just barely got here today because it was that big of an effort to get out of bed and put on clothes and come here and be in a room full of people. There are people in this room, I'll bet you, that they're hoping I don't get more specific about different things that cause shame because they're afraid I'll mention the thing that they're ashamed of, and then they're afraid that people will know that I'm talking about them, even though they've never told anyone. But that's the sense that shame gives you is everybody probably knows how bad I am. And if you think you're alone, you're wrong. And if you think you can do this alone, you're doubly wrong. And if you think that coming and sitting in a room like this is where you get answers, it's not. This is the beginning of the answers. You go further. You get deeper. You you get involved in a life group. You get into a small group of people, and you get honest in that small group, and you say, here's what I'm struggling with. And you just hold your breath and wait, and you'll see. They'll accept you. They'll love you. They'll pray for you. There's probably even going to be a person or two who will come up and say, I know what you're going through. That's the church that God created us to be. So, I want to tell you about my, one of my favorite parts of the Bible, and that's the end of the Gospel of John. You're probably aware that all three, all, all three, all four Gospels, all four Gospels contain the same story about Peter denying Jesus three times the night he was arrested. And here's Peter, right? The guy who has spent his whole life trying to convince everyone that he's the biggest and the bravest and the boldest and the one most worthy to lead the apostles. And just a few hours before, he had stood up and puffed out his chest and said, even if these other losers all run away in fear, I will never leave you, Lord. I will die before I step away. And then three times, just hours later, three times within the earshot of his Messiah himself, he says, I don't know that guy. Don't, don't. Don't put me together with these people. I, I don't know. I've never even met him. And the Scriptures say that after Jesus was taken away, when that cock crowed and, and he knew what he'd done, Peter wept. He wept tears of shame because he finally realized, I'm not the person I thought I was. Even that name, Peter, Jesus had given him that name. It means the rock. It sounded like a, an ironic insult. Now, like calling a fat guy slim or like calling a short guy jumbo, calling him the rock. It just didn't fit anymore. I'm a coward. And yet, John, the only one of the four Gospels, tells us that after the resurrection, and Peter is in the Sea of Galilee fishing in his boat with with six of the other disciples, and they look out on the shore and they see They see this figure sitting there in the haze, and he's cooking some breakfast over a fire. And one of them says, hey, that's the Lord. And Peter doesn't even wait for him to turn the boat around. He dives into the water and swims to the beach, and he comes up to Jesus, and he's been looking forward to this moment. See, there's a difference between Peter and Judas. Both of them deeply, deeply hurt the Lord on the night of his death. Judas was so ashamed, he went and hung himself. Peter Peter had hope. Peter said, even though I'm worthless now, I believe my God doesn't see me that way. But you got to understand, Peter knows what he's done is, is unprecedented. Yeah, Jesus talks about forgiveness all the time, but I don't know. Can he forgive this? Is there a limit on that forgiveness? And he comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, Simon, calls him by his given name. Hey, Simon, let's let's remove all the hype. Simon, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, you know I do. Then feed my sheep. Three times he says that, feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. How many times did you deny me, Peter? Three times? Well, that's how many times I'm going to tell you. I still want you to feed my sheep. I still want you to be the leader. I still want you to be the one. What greater honor is there? You're going to take care of the thing most precious to me, my people. 
So never, ever underestimate the mercy of our God. Our sins are many, but His mercy is more. It doesn't matter what we've done. No matter how you feel about yourself or what somebody said to you, His mercy will save your soul. It will draw you out of the depths. So cry out to Him today before another day passes. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for Your mercy, and we lift up the person, all the people in this room who are struggling in so many ways. Lord, the person who doesn't feel worthy to come here, I pray that they would see that Your grace makes us all worthy. Lord, for the person uh, who, who thinks about terrible things they've done in the past, help them to see that You saw that coming ahead of time and died even before they committed those sins, died an atoning death. Lord, for the person who is struggling emotionally and can't even define why and just doesn't feel worthy, I pray that they would see, Lord, Your love your love for them is, is so great, and you have a plan for them so magnificent. Lord, I pray that every single person would recognize how great your mercy is, how incredible the plans you have for them is, that we would find joy in that, that we would find our hope in you, and that it would change us into merciful people. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior, and our God, our Lord, we pray. Amen. So we're going to close today with how great is your love. Let's praise God for a love that covers all of our sins and more, all of our shame and more. And if you don't have a personal relationship with a God who loves you that much, that's transformed you, would you come forward, speak to me or Alan, we'll tell you the next steps to take to change your life. If you'd like to join our church family and just walk alongside us as we, as we go on that pilgrimage towards Zion. You can come forward this morning and make that commitment. Or if you need prayer, we're here to pray for you too. Let's stand, let's sing together, and you come if God's leading.
Thank you, Nathan and Matthew, for that closing song. And again, thank you uh, for being here this morning. Just a blessing uh, to be here each week in, in the Lord's house, uh, worshiping together, fellowshipping, spending time in God's Word. I want to invite those of you who are our guests to come back next week. If you're visiting today, I'd like to invite you to come back, maybe be a part of Life Group uh, at 945. All across this campus, we have Bible study and fellowship uh, for all ages, uh, kids on up through students, young adults, media adults, senior adults, all across our campus. You can visit uh, the team at the Welcome Center. They've got brochures there that let you know about each of the groups and where they meet on campus, and we'd love for you uh, to be a part of another way uh, to connect with God in worship and fellowship and in His Word on Sunday morning. Be sure you visit the, the Gideon table before you leave today and support their ministry. Also, the uh, boxes are still here uh, one last Sunday before they go out for Operation Christmas Child. So if you want to say a prayer over those, they're just out there in the atrium as well. Let me pray for you um, as we prepare to leave today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning and the opportunity we've had to, to come and look at the topic of mercy and just the unending mercy that you show us. And so help us this week uh, to live in light of that mercy and experience that, but also uh, to show uh, the kind of mercy that you show to us, uh, to those around us, and help others in our community, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our schools, uh, and just all around this area, see uh, what it is that, that we see in you, and they would see that in us. In your son's name I pray, amen.